Dr. C. Everett Koop once said, Healthcare is vital to all of us some of the time, but public health is vital to all of us all of the time. Working in the fields of public health and global health can be a rewarding experience with the ultimate vision of achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. The global pandemic has demonstrated the need for even more competent public health professionals now and in the future. And in this episode, we'll be talking about some important factors to consider when pursuing a PhD or DRPH, some tips to help you stand out in an interview, and how an MPH can add value to your public health and global health journey. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. My name is Gordon, and I'll be your host for this episode, along with fellow co-hosts Will, Linda, LaShawn, and a special guest, the one and only Dr. Greg Martin. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. Dr. Greg Martin is a medical doctor uh, working as a specialist in public health medicine for the health service executive in Ireland. Uh, And before moving to Ireland, he worked in the global health space in various roles, such as the director of elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV at the Clinton Health Access Initiative and the head of science and research at the World Cancer Research Fund. In addition to his role, his current role at HSE, uh, Dr. Martin is currently the editor-in-chief of the Academic Journal of Globalization and Health and holds an honorary associate professorship at Trinity College Dublin. He is also on the board of directors for Willola and the Irish Forum for Global Health. Uh, So Dr. Greg Martin would like to welcome you to the Public Health Insight Podcast. Hola, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Dr. Greg Martin is a seasoned uh, public health and global health expert. Um, I first learned about him a number of years ago through his insightful YouTube videos. Uh, I think he was the only one doing it at the time and still is one of very few still doing it. Um, his YouTube channel has almost 100,000 subscribers and almost 5 million total views. And I highly recommend for those who aren't familiar with his YouTube, YouTube channel, go and check it out for some amazing content that he, he, that he does. Um, yeah, we've had the honor of being able to invite him to this, to this um, podcast episode uh, to pick his brain about a variety of topics that I'm sure everyone's interested in, such as pursuing um, a public health education or a global health education, what careers are out there in the field of public health and global health, um, what, what are some of those core skills and competencies that are required for you to be a good global health or public health practitioner, and how to start identifying your area of interest in public health. So, Dr. Martin, um, before we begin getting into the, the weeds, I'm hoping that you could just tell us a little bit about how you became um, interested in you know, both medicine and ultimately public health, and how did you merge them together? Okay, thanks. Uh, Well, anyway, listen, as I said before, great to be here. Um, I'm really, really impressed with what you're doing. You're not only doing a pod, doing a podcast, but you are doing a great job of it. I mean, you're knocking it out the park. It's an absolute uh, fantastic uh, enterprise that you've got going here. So very impressed. Um, So I'll just I'll be quite brief so that we can have lots of back and forth. So I'm going to try and not waffle on too much on any of any any of the issues. And if you want to dig deeper, just throw just push me, push me and I'll, I'll, I'll dig a bit deeper. But my interest in public health, you know, I studied medicine in South Africa, and while working as a junior doctor, um, I, I, I landed up, I stumbled into a job that had a very uh, a, a big research component. And at the time, this was when the HIV epidemic or pandemic, in, in actual fact, um, was 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 really problematic, particularly in South Africa. South Africa had the highest incidence rate and the highest absolute number of HIV in the world. And it was a country that, despite their, at that point in time, this is the late 1990s, there being the availability of triple therapy, so highly active uh, antiretroviral drugs, uh, they were not being made available to the public in South Africa. And as a research unit that I was connected to, we started advocating very strongly for the, 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 the use and the access to antiretroviral drugs for people with HIV. And that was the first time I think that it occurred to me that the health problems that I was seeing in front of me 
weren't going to be solved by working harder as a doctor. You know what I mean? Like getting on my stethoscope and doing longer hours wasn't the solution. Mm -hmm. There was a systemic solution. There was a problem we needed to advocate for. We needed to fix something in the system. And by doing that, many, many more lives would be saved than my time spent in a clinic with a stethoscope working away uh, seeing patients one at a time. And so that was my first awakening to the fact that you could address health problems at a population level. Well, I mean, the, the notion, I obviously understood that that was a Conceptually, I knew that that was the case, but this was the reality of it dawned on me. Let's just say I had that awakening of, ah, okay, like that's this is what public health is. You know, you kind of like solve solve problems kind of upstream. And um, of the, I, I was I was I was I was fortunate to uh, to, to to get support to do uh, an MPH in, in London, and uh, at the end that that. That was the beginning of my, and I didn't have a plan at that point, by the way. I, like mm. I sort of thought I want to do public health with no real sense of what that would mean, where it would go. Um, like, I, I just sort of thought that's where I'm going and let me take that next step and get some education. Um, and that's that was the beginnings. Yeah. You currently work as a specialist in public health medicine. So you you might not have a might not have had a plan at the time, but you are where you are now. So what is your um, day-to-day look in your current role um, now that you know you can talk about pre-covid and now that we're in covid okay i mean that's interesting so um i'll give you a, and and we can do a deep dive on any one or all of these different let's call them buckets of <laughs> sort of as my career has unfolded but there was a time that i worked as um after my mph as a clinical research fellow so i had a little bit of exposure to academia and I considered the idea of pursuing a career in academia. So we can talk about that, what it means, the pros, the cons, what the kind of person you need to be and the, right. what, that, what that means. And I think there's, there's some real pluses and, and some real sort of reality checks you need to keep in mind in terms of a career in academia. Mm. Then I worked for a little while in the sort of not-for-profit space. Um, I, I worked at the World Cancer Research Fund um, and, you know, I was leading a science team and that was kind of quite an interesting role. And it was interesting in the sense that it kind of occurred to me that a big part of being effective in public health was learning management skills. So that prompted me to do an MBA, which I don't recommend everybody does because it was it kind of almost killed me doing it. But <laughs> there are ways to get education around management skills without doing an MBA that will really pay dividends in your career. And we can talk about that. I think that, that, that there's something useful in that. Mm -hmm. um, then after that, I did some consulting work just as an individual independent consulting consultant. Again, a super interesting idea if you're stuck for like, where do I go? What do I do next? Um, it's a very easy thing to pick up. There's loads of consulting work out there. People often think that there isn't work out there because they're not quite sure where to look, but mm -hmm. I'll, I can talk about how to find that consulting work. There's lots of it. Um, and uh, But again, there's pluses and minuses, and we can get into the weeds on that. Um, it's, it's a difficult thing to do in the long term, but it's a really nice thing to do for a little while because consulting work often leads to uh, a job with one of your clients. And right. that was the case with me. So one of my clients was the World Health Organization. I was doing some strategy work with them. And then that turned into, you know, at first it was like, well, will you come in as a consultant, but we need to put you at a desk because we need you physically here. And then it turned into, well, let's actually just give you a short-term contract. And then it's okay, well, let's turn that into a long-term contract. And jobs at places like the World Health Organization, UNICEF, UNAIDS, all of the kind of UN agencies, often the way in is by doing consulting work first. Very few people end up working at the WHO just by applying to a job cold um, right. and interviewing and getting the job. And uh, like just a little, so for example, I, I worked at the WHO for two years and I don't think I met a single person there who got their job just by applying to it online, you know, and being interviewed and getting the job. Like everybody kind of stepped into it in a kind of higgledy piggledy roundabout way. Right. And maybe the world shouldn't be like that, you know, for a lot mm -hmm. of, for, there's, there's a strong argument to say that it shouldn't be like that, but it is. So, you know, we just kind of need to roll with, with the reality that we've got in front of us. Um, so, and I can talk a little bit about that. So we can ask, you can ask me some questions about working in the WHO system or the UN system. There's some huge pluses Mm -hmm. And there's also some real, um, again, there's some real reality checks, especially about, you know, if you move to a city like Geneva, you, you, there's a couple of things you need to think about. Th then I worked as the director of elimination of military child transmission of uh, HIV at the, at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And that was 
So that was kind of my first step into kind of a very senior role, but and that kind of global health role where you're traveling all the time. So I was like getting right. on a flight, flying into Africa, bouncing around Africa for three days a week, going back, flying back into Europe, sleeping for a night or two, going back. It was just like I lived in airports. And so we need to talk about that because <laughs> it sounds exciting and it's kind of is exciting for a couple of months. And then after a while, you become a fraction of a human being, you know, <laughs> you're losing <laughs> weight and you think you've got anemia from some, you know. So you need to think about when in your life you can you can pour yourself into that kind of work it's you know it's not compatible with starting a family for example but i wanted to hone in on something you mentioned to the whole um the, um academia versus you know practice so yeah um, one of the questions we had here was you know there's you know you can do a phd for example later down the road that has a focus on um a public health area or you can do a drph so i was wondering if you could speak to what are the similarities there and where they start to diverge? I think even for me, that's something that I'm looking into and it'd be helpful to know. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, if you've got your eye on long-term academia, you want to work in a university, you want to apply for academic grants to do research, um, then you, you've you got to do a PhD. Mm. Now, you can start an academic career without a PhD, which is what I did. I worked as a clinical research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for, for two years. But it becomes very apparent very quickly that to progress in that world without a PhD would be extremely, extremely difficult. It, mm. it, it does, it can be done. And um, in my case, I had a medical degree. So there was a little bit of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you could probably kind of pr progress a little bit and kind of wangle that. But ultimately at some point in time uh, doing, and I was told this by people in academia, look, if you really want to take this further and you want a career in the space, like doing a PhD is going to be, is going to be a must. Um, and that's a huge, so there's a couple of things to think about there. A PhD is a big time sink. So there's an opportunity cost. So you really got to want to do it. I mean, don't do a PhD because you, you sort of were stuck for, you weren't quite sure what to do next. And it seemed like something you could do. It's right. a huge commitment. Um, I, and people that I know that have done PhDs, I mean, it's really, you pour your heart and soul in, and you really pour your heart and soul into kind of one thing for four years. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of like digging deep, you laser focused on a very, very specific research question. And so you pop out the other side very much kind of a, with a very specialist uh, uh, knowledge mm -hmm. and we can talk that's something else we should talk about a little bit is that uh, being a generalist versus a specialist because right. there's definitely different career paths there and there's pluses and minuses but suffice to say you want to go into acad if you want to go into academia you've got to do a PhD and if you're doing a PhD just be clear that that's the route that you you know be sure that that's what you're wanting to do that academia is like kind of where this is taking you to imagine that a PhD is a good stepping stone into, you can use a PhD as a stepping stone into a public health career in general, um, but that's a huge time commitment for very little additional benefit. In other right. words, like when you're applying for jobs, they very seldom are asking for a PhD that you know that like an, like an mph is often entry level so you'll often see in job adverts we're looking for somebody with a, a mph or equivalent right and um so i always say to people don't worry about exactly what type of master's degree you do nobody really minds that much you know mm -hmm. if you did an M msc in epidemiology or an mph or an msc in public health like nobody's going to be looking at your cv thinking oh my god he did the wrong kind of mph <laughs> you know that doesn't matter you, if you did a master's level something public healthy most people are kind of okay with that mm -hmm. and they're not they, they may be looking for a phd graduate if they're employing somebody that's going to be a super focused policy wonk on a very laser focused issue right, right. and in which case they're wanting someone that did a PhD in exactly that thing. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? So yeah. having a PhD doesn't make you qualified for that job. They want the guy that did the spent four years on that thing. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So you've either done a PhD in exactly, you've just by chance done a PhD on exactly the right topic to be the sort of yes. policy wonk that they're wanting to hire for that exact thing, or you're out of the game. In other words, like your chances are best like in academia where having the PhD kind of qualifies you to do postdoctoral work and to apply for all sorts of grants. And you, right. you know, you can branch out from your subject matter once you're in that academic environment. Um, but the thing about academia, and I'm gonna get back to your question because it's a good one. The thing about academia, just to kind of circle, just join, like finish the circle on like the PhD route, 
the, the pluses of academia is this. It's a lovely lifestyle. It's you spending a lot of time thinking and being intellectual and pontificating about the world around you. And, that, you know, that's really nice. If you like teaching, it's great. You can do a bit of teaching. You, you, so it's, it's a nice lifestyle. I think it's kind of a the hours that you work on ice it's it's a relatively low pressure environment in other words um there are there are pressures to like get grants to get money for your research and that's not easy but on a day-to-day basis you're 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 not typically uh and i'll give you an example i mean in my job i'm put in front of the press sometimes i did a press briefing the other day and i had uh, like cameras on me and 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 reporters asking me questions and sometimes asking me questions i didn't know the answer to and my (laughs) dumb answers got into the press this week you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. you don't get that really in academia. Mm. You know, they they've kind of got a little bit more breathing room. And okay, the downside of academia is this: people go into academia and often imagine that once you've got your PhD, you will be able to sit back and think about all the interesting questions you'd like to answer. Use your imagination. Be creative. Think of these very interesting questions, and then spend your career designing research projects and answering those questions. And some people do have that, but most people don't. The way it usually works is the funders, so the Wellcome Trust or Gates Foundation or somebody, put out a call for expressions of interest on what they want researched. And then you've got a whole lot of university PhD graduates competing with one another to get Mm -hmm. that grant. In other words, you're not always doing the research that you want to do. You're doing the research that a grant making organization once done and you're kind of almost working for them in a funny kind of way Mm. now keeping in mind you're going to be applying for grants in an area that you've already got an interest in so it's not that there's no overlap with your interest but the point is um there's very few grant making organizations out there that have just sort of said here's a big bucket of money and if you come up with an interesting question we'll just give you the money to do the research there's a little bit of that i'm not saying it doesn't exist uh but 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 you know, usually it's the other way around. Usually the, the people with the money are the people deciding on what questions they want answered and they're getting everybody to run around and compete for that money. So um, so you've got to keep that in mind. You might not land up doing... The other thing about doing a PhD is to, very often PhD candidates land up doing research that's really the research interest of their supervisor. So even doing the PhD itself, you're going to spend four years answering a question that might not even be your question. It's like, you know, you've got a supervisor and... You, you, but like I'm painting a bit of a bleak picture. I know a lot of people working in academia that are very, very happy um, and it's a nice mm. lifestyle. So, right. you know, don't knock it, but just keep, keep an open <laughs> mind. By contrast, a DRPH is, it's a very high level of uh, education. You are learning super duper hardcore uh, research skills, but you're also getting plugged into usually a uh, an organization where you do a practical and you spend some time really in the practice of public health. And so it's with a view to turning you into a public health practitioner. You can go the academic route with a DRPH. So you're actually opening up a lot of doors. You can use a DRPH to launch into academia, or you can kind of focus yourself in on practical, um, uh, you know, the, the practical application of research. And very often what you'll do in your DRPH is you'll design a research project around a problem that really exists in the organization that you've you've stapled mm. yourself onto mm. um, and that will because you're doing research that really translates into valuable outputs that the organization and other organizations like it would find useful it's often a very easy stepping stone into a career in that in that in that space so right. drph if you're not sure that you want to stay in academia it's a lovely a, a launch pad um, in, 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 into the practice of public health potentially. I'm wondering then for the DR, the DRPH I guess is tied to an organization's work whereas a PhD is more tied to an academic institution's um, research mandate based on a specific area that this the PhD candidate is focused on. Am I getting yep. that correct? Yep, yep, that's it. That's pretty that's much right, yeah. A lot of um, individuals or students are either searching for jobs in the context of COVID-19 or they're trying to pursue further education in public health. Sure, we mentioned the PhD, the DRPH, but interestingly, you mentioned your MBA. Is there any sort of other combination of degrees that could help elevate your skill set or toolkit in public health that may be interesting to consider? Yeah, so th- I mean, th- th- I think that that's a really interesting kind of. Uh, it's an interesting question because you're sort of asking, like, look, in lieu of me actually having a job right now, what can I do to kind of add to my value proposition? 
so that I'm more, more attractive to employers or what. So something that you, you, you kind of need to figure out some at some point in your career. And the reason why I was a little bit hesitant as I said those words is because I'm not sure that I've figured this out myself. <laughs> you know, there's, I, I often ask, like, I kind of think, well, what do I want to do when I grow up? And I, I haven't, I haven't got that completely nailed <laughs> down. Um, but this, this brings to, to my mind, this kind of begs the question of, um, big, being a, a generalist or a specialist. Mm-hmm. Um, and, do I want to develop skill sets that are general skill sets that are transferable and can be used in multiple different contexts? Or do I want to become a subject matter expert and really dig deep on something that I'm passionate about? And and that's not an easy question to answer. And in my case, I'm not even sure if I know the answer myself. Like I, I've spent a lot of my career working in the HIV space, but that was, I didn't really plan that. I kind of stumbled into that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, and, and let me give, put a little bit of flesh on the bones of those issues. If you, if you hunker down on a very, very focused, um, area of, 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 of interest and that area of interest might be a disease area or an area of exposure, or, you know, it could be a certain population group. You might be interested in refugees, um, or, you know, disenfranchised people, or it might be human rights, it could be climate change and health. You know, um, so there's a range of things that it could be, but you kind of like take a topic and you say, say I'm going to make, I'm going to become, I'm going to become a, a, like a world leading expert in this space. The advantage of doing that is it's easier than you think to really get on top of a subject matter. Like if you want to mm-hmm. become like, the, like a, 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 like a, 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 a world leading voice in a, in a very focused area, that's not that difficult. If you, if you stay laser focused on one thing. And you can progress quite quickly because you can, you know, you can, you can, it's not, it's not difficult to kind of become known as somebody that knows a lot about something. The downside of that is that you're likely to kind of box yourself into that. And uh, you need to be prepared to kind of do that for the next, you know, the rest of your, not necessarily, but it becomes difficult to kind of swap over onto something else. You know, so if you, if you, if you super duper focused on a particular area, Sometimes it can be difficult to break out. Now, there's exceptions to that. Uh, like I've seen people, a good friend of mine spent 20 years doing HIV research. And uh, recently he phoned me up and he sort of said, look, when we finished medical school, HIV was the big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but now the big challenge facing humanity is climate change and health. And I'm making a change. I'm going to swap wow. over from HIV to climate change. And I was a, like, I kind of was a little bit startled. And I was like, Matthew, um, dude, that's kind of quite brave because you're now competing with other people that have been working in climate change for 20 years and you mm-hmm. like hardly, you know, know how to tell what, what the weather's looking like. Look, <laughs> what are you doing? And he was quite smart about it. So he started off getting his first grants, looking at the effect of climate change on things that overlapped with HIV. So he used the fact that he had an HIV background as the platform of his expertise to get the grants and he's taken it from there and he's done quite nice, but that's exceptional. I, I think people struggle to make that change. The other, the other scenario is you become a generalist, right? So you do a little bit of what I did, which I enjoyed, but I'll tell you why it's difficult sometimes. So you can go out and you can do an MBA or something I, like an MBA is kind of a, is, was a bit much, I think. It, well, it, like it's, it's kicking in, it's becoming useful now, to be honest, at this stage in my career, but it was a huge uh, undertaking. You can do shorter kind of diplomas in management or things, just get that skill set, get mm-hmm. that general, how do I get things done skill set. Um, and you become a generalist and you kind of keep a broad sense of epidemiology and you kind of have a, a sense of what's happening in public health along a lot of streams. And that's useful, but you w- keep in mind that when you're applying for a job, that job is usually in some subject matter where you're competing with the guy next to you who went the other route and became a subject matter right. expert and has been doing that thing for 20 years. And so you really got to make a strong case for yourself in that job interview that despite the fact that there's definitely people out there that have much more technical knowledge about the subject, I'm your guy because I can get things done. That's, you got to make that argument and you got to make it strong. And you, like, I literally say that in interviews. <laughs> I use those words. I literally say, I will get things done. I'll tell you a couple of things that I do in interviews if you want to know. Oh, and I don't know if they're good or bad, but I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> Should we do a quick tangent on interviews? Yes, yes, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Okay, just a couple of things <laughs> while I'm thinking about it. The first thing is, I won't talk long about interviews. We can come back to this. But the first thing is this. It, 
in the beginning of an, most interviews, they ask you like a softball question just to get the ball rolling. And um, they, it might be like, oh, tell us about yourself or like just walk us through your CV or just, mm-hmm. you know, they're just kind of giving you. Now, there's an opportunity there to hijack the to hijack that question. In other words, ignore the question. You know, they say when you're speaking to uh, when you're speaking to reporters, like don't accept the premise of the question. Give them right. an answer that you right. want to give them anyway. Right. Right. You've got something prepared that you're going to give, no matter what they ask in that first question. Obviously, you want to be polite, so you don't you don't want to just kind of ignore what they've said. You want to just sort of. So what I often try to say in the beginning of an interview, in no, almost no matter what the first question is, is I say, look, what I want to talk about. And I hope this answer kind of addresses what you're asking. Is I just want to talk a little bit about what I think is really going to be needed in the job that's been advertised, and how it is that the experience I've got and the skill sets that I have um, are going to contribute to that, or how I'm going to add value, or what my sort of value proposition is. So I say, so I just bring it back to like, this is who I am. This is what you're looking for, and I think there's a good match there. And mm-hmm. I, even those words, I sometimes say that. You know what I mean? I, like I think this is what you're looking for, and I think that's me. You know, and people don't mind you saying that. They, 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 that's kind of the question they're trying to answer. Like, is this the right guy? And you get to say, like, yes, I am. I'm, I am the right guy. Um, and I've sometimes said that and not gotten the job. So you know, you've got to, you've got to live with that as well. But, but I will. But I will often. I will often. So if they said to you, walk me through your CV. I don't do a chronological. Okay, I finished medical school and then I did this and then I did that and then I did mm-hmm. this. They can read that on your CV. I say to them, look, the things that I think you need in this job are good. It kind of uh, uh, depending on what the job is, but I might say I think you're needing good leadership and good management skills in this particular role, and this, the experience I've had in terms of leadership, and then I and then I usually break that down, and I say like I want to just talk a little bit about like leadership in terms of you know uh, 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 st- strategic leadership, and then you know you talk a little bit about that, and you know there's mm-hmm. different kinds of leadership, different kinds of management, I, like I won't get into it in this conversation, but I break it down a little bit, and I say this is the experience that I have that I think will be useful in this particular role. So I, I, I never walk through my CV chronologically because I don't think that's useful. Like I, I extract out the skills that I really want to talk about, and I bring that into that first question. And I do the same thing right at the end. So at the end, you know, they say to you in an interview, "Do you have any questions?" Mm-hmm. They always say that. Mm-hmm. I don't have any questions. I say to them, "I don't have a question, but I'd like to give you a closing statement." Ah. And then I tell you what you put into this closing statement. You tell them, "Look." Because they've now they've heard all about what you can do and your skills, and they don't need to hear that again. But what they don't know yet, and you got to tell them this, because this is where you leave them with the impression. You say you say to them this: you say, "Look, I'm hardworking, and I'm easy to work with. I'm a nice guy. I get on well with my colleagues." So, mm. You know what Soft I mean? Skills, yeah. Like, and say something about just talk about those two things. Like, I'm really hardworking, I, 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 and I'm passionate about this, and tell them I really get on well with the people that I work with. I'll tell you why you want to say that. They're sitting across the desk, or nowadays across the Zoom call, or whatever, and they think to themselves, "When I get to work on Monday, is, do I want to work with this guy or this right. woman?" That's what they're thinking. They're thinking like, "Like I'm going to spend time, especially if the person on the other side is the hiring manager." They're thinking, "Do I want to work with this person? Do I?" And if you just say to them, "Look, I get on well with the people I work with. I'm easy to work with," that they, that's like a big tick. Mm-hmm. That they're thinking. Yeah, I, that, I do want to work with Greg. He's a, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's dead right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that wasn't on their list. That wasn't on their competency list. But th- that's a huge tick. And nobody says it in an interview. And why not? Why not just say it? Yeah. How are they supposed to know that? Just tell them. I'm a nice guy. I get on well with the people I work with. I enjoy work. I get to work. I've got a positive attitude. Just say it. No, uh, it, sure. it means a lot. And it's not... You know, we go into interviews thinking tick box, tick box, tick box. I want to tell them that I can do this, I can do that, I can add up numbers, I can spell. Don't just tell them I'm a nice guy. I get on well. I work hard. You know, I, I've got a positive attitude. Say these things, and uh, it means a lot. Um, the other thing I'll tell you about during the interview, if they are, usually have an example or two for every kind of competency that you think they're going to ask around, yes. and then explain that this is what I did, and this is how I think. That skill relates to the job you're advertising. Show them that you know what is expected of you in the job. Right. So, if it's, you know, so, so I've demonstrated the skill. I'm good at statistical analysis, and I did a thing, and we drew a graph. And in this job, I think that's important because a big part of what you're doing is M and E, and I'm going to be able to apply myself to that. Right. So, so, so join those dots between what I can do and what I know is important for this job, and do that with every single question. Uh, and and that's a very strong interview. 
yeah we had a question in the meantime that maybe you can before we transition to the next theme um from jenny um asking about um if D- a drph doing a drph is more beneficial for students coming from other master's degrees um and do you think that there is any benefit for mph students you know going transitioning and doing a drph okay i think i mean the that- super good question really really interesting and and uh, um it's not often that i get asked a question that i haven't been asked before so that's okay. <laughs> i've never been asked that before so that's the first because uh, uh, i i talk about this quite a lot you know so I, I, um right if you're coming from a different field okay let's row back a little bit i think there's a role for public health for people from all sorts of walks of life right mm-hmm. if you're an engineer we've got engineering problems you know, we want to get clean water to people, blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of things. It, there's almost nothing, you know, if you're a mathematician, oh my goodness, we could use mathematicians. You know, if you're like, there's very few walks of life that I wouldn't be able to think of like a role for you in public health in some shape or form. So there's definitely going to be people out there um, who have done a master's degree in something com- completely unrelated. Mm. And, uh, but they're thinking that they'd like to step into public health. Mm-hmm. And, I don't know what the acceptance criteria are or aren't for DRPHs, but if you could step in from one of those other disciplines and step straight into a DRPH program, and I don't know if the person asking the question was alluding to that, but then I would really recommend it. That is a, a really nice transition into public health and you'd be setting yourself up for like a very interesting career because you'd be bringing a, a beautiful, delicious kind of combination of skill sets. Um, which would be, you know, you'd be, you're, you would be a rare asset. You'd be extremely valuable. So that's interesting. The second part of that question was, well, if I have an MPH, how much sort of additional value add is there in terms of doing a DRPH? And um, I, I suppose you need to weigh up the opportunity cost. So how long is a DRPH going to take you, and what might I have done with that time otherwise? Um, but DRPH is quite practical, so you're not you're not wasting time. There's an expense, so can you afford it? I mean, these maybe you can get a scholarship and would if you can get a scholarship and you're you're young and you've got the time and you're not in a hurry, you know it's not, it's not going to do you any harm to do a DRPH. But I don't think people need to feel that they need a DRPH. Uh, if you've got an MPH um, and you're not thinking of academia as a career choice, then you're set in terms of education. You, 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 then you want to start thinking about skills and experience and you're good to go there's nothing wrong with getting additional education and um you know and, and i did but you you honestly you've you now there are there's exceptions to that for example you know i'm working in ireland if you want to work in a country and you want to get deep into the public health system and you're a medical doctor medical doctors often in most countries have the option of specializing in public health and that's that's a whole and I've done that here in Ireland. And it, I came to Ireland without having done that. So I'd been working in public health, came to Ireland because I married an Irish lass and found it was very difficult for me to get into the system without going through the specialist training. That's that's the route in. That was the, you know, you needed to tick that box. And that was not an easy thing for me because it was four years of going back and being like effectively a student and doing exams. And this is in my 40s. So that was a bit of a bit of a to swallow. But I did it and, you know, it's gotten me in the system. And, you know, so now I don't need to worry about that now. But that is so for people that are medical doctors um, and they're thinking about public health, then special, doing the SBR, the specialist training in public health, if, if you know that that's the country you're going to live in and work in, uh, isn't a bad idea because it opens up all sorts of doors and opportunities. Um, uh, but that, you know, so that, so if there are people you know that are listening that are medical doctors in public health and they and, I, and they're wondering should I do this specialist training in public health? Um, they, you, they, it's actually it's actually not a bad idea because you're getting paid, right? So you, right. You, you, you're getting training, but at the same time you're getting a salary, you're getting paid, and then most of them will pay for you to do an MPH. So like you actually getting a salary while you're doing it. It's a really sweet deal. You've just heard part one of Gordon, LaShawn, Will, and Linda's conversation with Dr. Greg Martin, a medical doctor working as a specialist in public health medicine based in Ireland, about some factors to consider when pursuing a PhD or the RPH. 
He also shared some tips to help you stand out in an interview and how an MPH can add value to your public health and global health journey. Tune into the next episode for the second half of the discussion, where they discuss jobs, careers, consulting, transferable skills, core competencies, and how to identify your areas of interest. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our content and would like to stay up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. To learn more about our community initiatives and how you can support us, visit our website at thepublichealthinsight.com. Join the PHI community and let's make public health viral.